So Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't know shit about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you don't know shit about shit. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The pyramid on the bottom, you got the physiological needs. Food, water, shelter, bread, clothing. So your basic biological and physiological needs. Warmth, sleep, sex. You also need, number two, your safety needs. You need to feel safe, protection from the elements, security, order, law, limits, stability. So uh, protection from the weather, protection from other violent people, animals. That's the second bottom thing. I'm going from the bottom up. So you need your basic necessities with life. Then two, you need safety, security. Three, you need belongingness and love needs. Work group, family affection, relationships. So you need to feel like you're belonging with other people. Number four is your esteem needs. You need to feel good about yourself. Uh, good about your achievements, mastery, your independence, your status, your dominance, your prestige, managerial responsibility. Five is your cognitive needs, your knowledge and meaning. So you just want to learn and study because uh, you want to understand what the meaning of things are. You want to increase your knowledge. So that's the fifth level. The sixth level is the aesthetic needs. It's the appreciation and the search for beauty, balance, and form. So your aesthetic needs is... Uh, um, you know, just what's beautiful, which is what's balanced. So you got to be able to figure out these things, beauty and balance. And then the very last one is self-actualization. And actually, they got an eight here, which I think would be interesting to talk about. But self-actualization needs. This is when you become, you realize yourself. You become self-actualized, right? It's a little lofty, but it's got actually really deep meaning. It's re realizing your personal potential, self-fulfillment. Seeking personal growth and peak experiences. Your transcendence needs, which is eight, uh, which is something that seems added, but I think it's relevant. It's helping others to achieve self-actualization. So once you get to the top of self-actualization and become self-actualized yourself, it is your duty to turn around and help other people get to nirvana, just like you are. That's what you're supposed to do. To talk is something to teach is divine. <laughs> Uh, Self-actualization, it's uh, stated that human motivation is based on people seeking fulfillment and change through personal growth. He describes self-actualized people as those who were fulfilled and doing all they were capable of doing. So some of the characteristics of self-actualized people, they perceive reality efficiently and can tolerate uncertainty. They accept themselves and others for what they are. They're spontaneous in thought and action. They're problem-centered, not self-centered. They have an unusual sense of humor. They are able to look at life objectively. They're highly creative. They're uh, resistant to enculturation, but not purposely unconventional. We have a concern for the welfare of humanity. They're capable of deep appreciation of basic life experience. They establish deep, satisfying interpersonal relationships with a few people. They have peak experiences. They have a need for privacy. They have democratic attitudes. And they got strong moral and ethical standards. Behavior which leads to self-actualization. Experiencing life like a child with full absorption and concentration. Trying new things instead of sticking to safe paths. Listening to your own feelings and evaluating experiences instead of the voice of tradition, authority, or the majority. Uh, avoiding pretense, game playing, and being honest. Be prepared to be unpopular if your views do not coincide with those of the majority. Taking responsibility and working hard. Trying to identify your defenses and having the courage to give them up. The characteristics of self-actualizers and the behaviors leading to self-actualization are shown in the list above. Although people achieve self-actualization in their own unique way, they tend to share certain characteristics. However, self-actualization is a matter of degree. There are no perfect human beings. It's not necessary to, to display all 15 characteristics to become self-actualized, and not only self-actualized people will display them. Maslow did not equate self-actualization with perfection. Self-actualization merely involves... Achieving one's potential. That's self-actualization. So if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will grow up its entire life thinking it's stupid. 
So, uh, so someone can be silly, wasteful, vain, impolite, and still self-actualize. Less than two percent of the population achieve actual self-actualization. So, less than two percent of people actually get to the top of that pyramid of Maslow. And Maslow come up with this shit, sixty-eight, and he's been around for uh, like decades, fifty-four maybe, nineteen fifty-four. So, sixty years Maslow's been out there. How come we haven't been talking about Maslow? This is the first time I've come across Maslow and had to talk about him. Uh, 9-11, okay? Now that we've talked about Maslow, now we're going to talk about 9-11. 9-11 was an atrocious atrocity, right? It's an atrocious atrocity. It's not just a regular atrocity, it's atrocious. Uh, and it, you know, killed innocent people, and killing innocent people is always wrong. Now, if we want to seriously figure out what happened with 9-11, or why we got attacked on 9-11... If we're talking seriously about it, I mean, if we're just trying to be jingoist and we're trying to use 9/11 as the way Bush used it as a reason to, um, you know, cover up the crimes that he was about to commit, but if we're actually wanting to see the reasons, why did we get attacked on 9/11? What was the point? What was the purpose? Uh, I think uh, Bin Laden's voice was instructive in his purpose, especially since he's been martyred now, and a lot of people have been saying he'd been killed for years, and all they did was just um, publicly come and say it, talk about it, and then they hid the evidence. How do, you know, how do we know if he's dead? We don't, we don't know. They say they did it for respect. That's why they dumped him out and slept, made him sleep with the fishes. That's why, out of respect, they made Bin Laden sleep with the fishes out of respect. Is that what they did? So, um, I'll just keep on reading Bin Laden until the time is up. Six minutes. I got seven minutes. Um, or eight, nine minutes. Bin Laden. This is on worldpress.org, Americas. Transcript of Osama Bin Laden's speech. Al Jazeera.net, Doha, Qatar, October 30th, 2004. So this is an old, this is eight years old. Bin Laden. <clears throat> Praise be to Allah, who created the creation for his worship and commanded them to be just and permitted the wrong one to retaliate against the oppressor in kind to proceed be peace be unto he who follows the guidance people of america this talk of mine is for you it concerns the ideal way you prevent another manhattan and deals with the war and its causes and results before i begin i say to you that security is an indispensable pillar of human life and that free men do not forfeit their security contrary to bush's claim that we hate freedom if so, then let him explain to us why we don't strike, for example, Sweden. Why, why didn't uh, Osama bin Laden strike Sweden if he hates freedom, since there's freedom in Sweden? And we know that freedom haters don't possess defiant spirits like those of the 19. May Allah have mercy on them. No, we fight because we are free men who don't sleep under oppression. We want to restore freedom to our nation, just as you lay waste to our nation, so shall we lay waste to yours. No one except a dumb thief plays with the security of others and then makes himself believe he will be secure. Whereas thanking people when disaster strikes makes it their priority to look for its causes in order to prevent it from happening again. But I'm amazed at you. Even though we are in the fourth year after the events of September 11th, Bush is still engaged in distortion, deception, and hiding from you the real causes. And thus the reasons are still there for a repeat of what occurred. So I shall talk to you about the story behind those events and shall tell you truthfully about the moments in which the decision was taken for you to consider. I say to you, Allah knows that it has never occurred to us to strike the towers. But after it became unbearable, and we witnessed the oppression and tyranny of the American-Israeli coalition against our people in Palestine and Lebanon, it came to my mind. The events that affected my soul in a direct way started in 1982 when America permitted the Israelis to invade Lebanon under Ronald Reagan, and the American Sixth Fleet helped them out in that. This bombardment began, and many were killed and injured, and others were terrorized and displaced. I couldn't forget those moving scenes, blood and severed limbs, women and children sprawled everywhere. Houses destroyed along with their occupants and high rises demolished over their residence. Rockets raining down on our home without mercy. The situation was like a crocodile meeting a helpless child, powerless except for his screams. Does the crocodile understand a conversation that doesn't, doesn't include a weapon? And the whole world saw and heard, but it did not respond. 
In those difficult moments, many hard-to-describe ideas bubbled in my soul. But in the end, they produced an intense feeling of rejection, of tyranny, and gave birth to a strong resolve to punish the oppressors. And as I looked at those demolished towers in Lebanon, it entered my mind that we should punish the oppressor in kind and that we should destroy towers in America in order that they taste some of what we tasted and so that they be deterred from killing our women and children. And that day, it was confirmed to me that oppression and the intentional killing of innocent women and children is a deliberate American policy. Destruction is freedom and democracy, while resistance is terrorism and intolerance. This means the oppressing and the embargoing to death millions of Bush, of millions as Bush Sr. did in Iraq, in the greatest mass slaughter of children mankind has ever known, and it means the throwing of millions of pounds of bombs and explosives at millions of children, also in Iraq, as Bush Jr. did, in order to remove an old agent and replace him with a new puppet to assist in the pilfering of Iraq's oil and other outrages. So with these images and their like as their background, the events of September 11th came as a reply to those great wrongs. Should a man be blamed for defending his sanctuary? Is defending oneself and punishing the aggressor in kind objectionable terrorism? If it is such, then it is unavoidable for us. This is the message which I have sought to communicate to you and were indeed repeatedly for years before September 11th. And as you read this, if you wish, in my interview with Scott in Time Magazine in 1996 or with Peter Arnett in CNN 1997 or my meeting with John Weiner in 1998. And you can observe it practically, if you wish, in Kenya and Tanzi, Tanzania and in Aden. And you can read it with my interview with Abdul Barry Atwan, as well as my interviews with Robert Fisk. The latter one is one of your compatriots and co-religionists, and I consider him to be neutral. So are the pretenders of freedom at the White House and the channels controlled by them able to run an interview with him so that he may re relay to the American people what he has understood from us to be the reasons for our fight against you? If you were to avoid these reasons, you would have taken the correct path that will lead America to the security that it was in before September 11th. This concerned the causes of the war. As for its results, they have been, by the grace of Allah, positive and enormous, and have by all standards exceeded all expectations. This is due to many factors, chief among them that we have found it difficult to deal with the Bush administration in light of the resemblance it bears to the regimes in our countries, half of which are ruled by the military and the other half which are ruled by the sons of kings and presidents. Our experience with them is lengthy, and both types are replete with those who are characterized by pride, arrogance, greed, and the misappropriation of wealth. This resemblance began after the visits of Bush Sr. to the region, at a time when some of our compatriots were dazzled by America and hoping that these visits would have an effect on our countries. All of a sudden, he was affected by those monarchies and military regimes and became envious of their remaining decades in their positions to embezzle the public wealth of the nation without supervision or accounting. So he took dictatorship and suppression of freedoms to his son, and they named it the Patriot Act, under the pretense of fighting terrorism. In addition, Bush sanctioned the installing of sons as state governors, uh, uh, and didn't forget to import ex uh, expertise in election fraud from the region's presidents to Florida to be made use of in moments of difficulty. So he knows about the election fraud that happened in America. All that we have mentioned has made it easy for us to provoke and bait this administration. All that we have to do is to send two Mujahideen to the furthest point east to raise a piece of cloth on which is written Al-Qaeda in order to make the general race there to cause America to suffer human, economic, and political losses without their achieving for it anything of note other than some benefits for their private companies. This is in addition to our having experience in using guerrilla warfare and the war of attrition to fight tyrannical superpowers as we alongside the Mujahideen bled Russia for 10 years until it went bankrupt and was forced to withdraw and retreat. And we're seeing a historical parallel right now. Russia was sunk by Afghanistan. America is being sunk by Afghanistan. All praise is due Allah. So we are continuing this policy and bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy. Allah willing, and nothing is too great for Allah. That being said, those who say that Al-Qaeda has won against the administration in the White House, but that the administration has lost in this war, have not been precise. Because when one scrutinizes the results, one cannot say that Al-Qaeda is the sole factor in achieving the, those spectacular gains. 
Rather, the policy of the White House that demands the opening of war fronts to keep busy their various corporations, whether they be working in the field of arms or oil or reconstruction, has helped Al-Qaeda to achieve these enormous results. It's because of America's aggression is why Al-Qaeda is gaining a foothold in the Middle East and the rest of the world. More of Bin Laden coming up.